Okay, I think we should just start with, because the last episode I realized, even though we were drinking water, we, we did not do the thing. So Mr. Announcer Guy, do your thing. Cue that cue. It's time to drink some water. <sighs> That's good water. That is good water. Welcome everybody to the James Arnold Taylor Podcast. I'm, okay, so right off the bat, I sound a little funky. And I talked about this at the end of the last episode, and I'm recording this now, the same day I recorded that. So here's how it works. I've been recording as many episodes as I can for all of you because I know everybody loves a podcast. I love doing the podcast. I'm trying to get as many done as I can so we can just have them out, right? So last week was Megacon in Orlando, Florida. Now, you're probably listening to this weeks after Megacon, Florida. You're probably, this is going to come out, we'll see you Uh, This week, I have my interview with Lydia, my daughter, coming out, and then the next week is part two, and then the next week is part one, which you just heard, and now this is part two of the Hidden Blessings interview. My goodness, there is a lot, there are so many episodes, but okay, so so it's like a month since Megacon happened back in February, right? But for me, it's not. Whoa, Doc, this is heavy. We're going through the space-time continuum here because I've been recording episodes earlier and then putting them out. So for all of you, it's probably like we're into March. But for me, it's February 10th, Saturday, February 10th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Central Time. Just for anybody taking notes like you care. All right. (laughs) And I am getting over a bad cold that I got at Megacon. So I sound terrible, I know. But I wanted to get this part two of this episode of the podcast. And there's a lot in this episode about Hidden Blessings, my film, which I want you all to see. But in the meantime, you can hear the behind the scenes stories about the movie. So that when you do see the movie, maybe it's kind of fun. You go, oh, I remember James and Matt talked about that. So my my producing partner, Matthew Buds, one of my best friends in the world, I love him. And he's fantastic. And we sat down for, and we talked for hours. And then I've cut that down to just these small little, well, not small, they're still long, an interview with Matt on the movie Hidden Blessing. This is part two of my time with Matthew Buds talking about our film, Hidden Blessings. We're just going to get into it because I, I need to go rest my voice, don't I? All right. <laughs> Here we go. Cue that thing, Jerry the music or whoever. Who's cueing this? I don't even know. It was not me. All right, Hank. Oh, you sound, yeah. I could do Hank all day because I sound like this. Uh, you sound just like me. I know, I do. Okay. Cue that interview with Matthew Buds talking about hidden blessings here on the James Arnold Taylor podcast. I do think it's funny. I'm, I'm laughing. You're going to laugh because you know where I'm going with this. The film has been called Groundbreaking. Yes, it has. By some film companies that looked at it. They passed on it. They were like, no, we're not going to make it. Or we're not going to... um. We're not going to put, put it, it out, out right. distribute it for you, but it's a groundbreaking idea. And I think that was the thing is they didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. There's not a lot of movies, especially there's comedies out there that are faux documentaries, mockumentaries, right. but the actual category of this movie would be called a mockumentary, mockumentary right. but it's not mocking anything. It's not comical. It's a drama. There's some very funny moments in it, I yes, think. Absolutely. And there's some very lighthearted moments in it. But it is supposed to be like a docu series, mm-hmm. and we shot enough footage that we actually could make it a series. Right? People have talked about that too. Well, you can make it a, a series, like six episode series, instead of just a movie, because that was the other thing. So we shot for six months, something like that. Yeah, off and on, right? Off and on for six months, and we cast the people. We need to talk about that still too. And then we're left with I don't know how many hours of footage. Yeah, quite a bit. Probably a 40, 40, 50 yeah, hours exactly, of, yeah. of footage. That we shot. So let's back up a little there then. So the film is written. We have nine scenes. We start to shoot. We need to cast. So Mm -hmm. we go out. And I think the first person we cast outside of yourself and myself was M. M -hmm. M Genovese. Yep. M played Ava. Ava is Lydia Drake's friend from school, Mm -hmm. from film school. And there's a much deeper storyline in there that I wrote, you know, when I was coming up with various versions of this, but she is the producer of the movie within the movie. 
and Ava is somebody that has ties to the art world. They're the same age, but she's kind of mentoring, I mm-hmm. guess, Lydia in this process because she knows the film world. In my whole backstory of Ava, there is this whole thing that, yeah, she grew up kind of more in, in that world. And she grew up in the art world mm-hmm. and she knows art people and she has a fiance that's a, that's an art dealer and stuff. And so that was kind of my whole side story there. Right. So that's not in the movie, but M's like, man, why isn't oh, that? Darn give, it. Me some, give me some stuff I can sink my teeth into. <laughs> so we found this wonderfully talented young actress named M Genovese and M auditioned. We had several, we had a, quite a few auditions Time. for, for yeah. that character. And she stood out Yes, because I remember we were in a, parking lot at a film production facility mm-hmm. uh, view studios right. view studios and you're like oh this one came in and we looked and we watched i remember thinking good for her because she got it she understood it the pacing she, and yeah exactly. she understood the pacing she understood the language she she spoke what i wrote the way that it was supposed to be spoken yeah and that i went okay yeah we should we should meet with her so we met with her yeah and she was a lovely young gal. It was easy to cast her because the authority she brought into the room when we interviewed her was similar to the authority she brought into the audition. Yeah. She's just very confident, but not like arrogant, confident, confident and humble in the yeah. same breath. And she carries yeah. herself well. She's yeah. got a great voice. Yeah. yeah. And she's got a beautiful singing voice. She's right. a singer. She is. And stage performer and such as well. And actress on camera as, as well. All of that. She's, she's the whole deal. Mm-hmm. And we sat with her in this little cafe and talked and got to know each other. And we were very open about this is a faith-based movie. Mm-hmm. Are you okay with that? And, you know, she's like, well, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that in any way. It's just, that's great, you know. Mm-hmm. I guess after that, then we sent her the script and she looked through it. But, yeah, afterwards, uh, right. Uh, well, after, we but, sent pieces of script. Yeah. Yeah. We sent all of them. Only pieces, only pieces of the of script, script right. because we wanted to keep a lot of it a surprise because right. of the way we were filming it. We didn't want them to know everything. Right. Until it was time to know. Exactly right. So M is cast. We've got Ava. Yep. We need Lydia, yep. the star of it. We need the two sons. Yep. And now it's no longer Tom Wilson. So we need two sons that look like my sons that you would buy would be my sons. Yes. Your sons with... The character of Grace, who is played by. <laughs> so that's the other funny thing. <laughs> so originally, when this was going to be Tom Wilson and stuff too, I was like, man, we're going to have to hire a, a lookalike for Tom and, yeah. and then find an actress to play Grace. And at the time, I was actually thinking about Ashley Eckstein oh. to play Grace because Grace would only really be seen in found footage. Yeah. Photographs, yep. videos. So this the character of Grace, Gregory Davidson's wife, has passed away. She passed away decades ago. Yep. So how do you do that? Well, thankfully, I've been married to my wife for 30 plus years. And we met in high school and we have a world of video and pictures and all of that. And my wife, who is still very much alive, my lovely wife, Allison, was very willing to allow me to use all of our own personal home movies, photographs, all of that mm-hmm. of our lives to tell the story of Grace and Gregory. Right. And it makes it perfect it because does. when you look back on all this footage, the funny thing about it too is so much of the video of me back then, I had long hair and a beard. <laughs> That's right. And so my character has long yeah, hair yeah. and a beard. So it was really perfect. When you looked at it, you went, oh yeah, well, that's That's, Gregory. Well, clearly it is because it is. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I mean, it really is me. So that was the other thing I had put. So back when I first shot that scene of Gregory telling the story of what happened to Grace Mm -hmm. and I put, I used images and I cut it all together as kind of a demo to try and get investors. And this is, this is, you know, four years, four, yeah, about four years ago, I'm pitching it to a place and we send it off to these guys and they watched the scene and they wanted to take a meeting with me to talk about, you know, maybe giving me money to finish the movie. And the first thing they say is we're so sorry for your loss. So, because they completely bought it. Right. And I thought, well, that's great. Cause it's not, I said, Oh, this is a movie that that's not, I mean, that's real footage, but my my wife and I, but she's alive. That's just, we're using it in this to tell the story of these other people. So my wife plays grace and that was wonderful. But we needed to find actors that look that you could buy as both of our kids. kids. Right. So the journey begins. And we're no longer in Hollywood, you and I. But where we live is still uh, an active area for mm-hmm. actors, performers, sure. music, a lot of music here where we live. But 
how do we find two talented actors that'll do that that are you know, unknown too? Mm -hmm. We're making this movie literally out of pocket. We make the decision. We couldn't make the comic shop out of pocket. Right. It's going to cost too much money. Right. Maybe we'll do a Kickstarter or something at some point. All of you, if you, I, I know many of you have said you would, you would give to it. That would be wonderful. Anyways, Hidden Blessings is made entirely out of money I had in my pocket. Right. So we were just paying actors as they come in and do this stuff. Yep. So we get M. And was it Lydia next? I believe it was Kylie. Uh, I'm I'm losing the time between Kylie and Drew, who plays the older son. But it was I think it was Kylie first. Right. So Kylie. Okay, we find her through, oh, oh, yeah, through Steve Taylor. Okay, so, yes. Boy, this is a convoluted story. Yeah, we are way over, man. We're going to be in, like, <laughs> this is a mini series within itself. Steve Taylor and Mike Naraki are making a show called The Dead Sea Squirrels, which I am in. And Jason Marsden and I are in, and it's a cartoon based on Mike Naraki's books of the same name. Mike Naraki is famously known as Larry the Cucumber in Veggie Tales. He's one of the co-creators of Veggie Tales. So I'm working with them on this cartoon, Dead Sea Squirrels. I say, do you guys know of any good actors? We need to find a talented young actress. She needs to kind of meet these criteria for looks and such. And very specifically because there needs to be, you know, the question of whether or not she's actually my daughter. Right. My character's daughter, Gregory Davidson's daughter and such. Mm -hmm. So Steve Taylor, who is also very well known as a Christian rock artist mm -hmm. in the 80s. And he had a song, what I love it, uh, about being a clone. He had a song, I don't want to be a clone. <laughs> so I love that. But anyway, so Steve is a great guy. And Steve then says, yeah, I know a few people, but he, I think he, he specifically, specifically said, said her, you Kylie. need to meet this gal. Yeah. And Kylie was actually working with me on Dead Sea Squirrels, but we had never met because we record separately. So he connects us with her. You send her all the info mm -hmm. to audition. We had the sides. So if you're doing an audition for people, you make up what they call sides. And sides are just simply what? You want to explain sides? Yeah, it's kind of you extract a portion of the script out uh, that's going to show some sort of dynamic range within that character without giving away anything. Right. And then you just you send them those page or two for them to create a video or well now it's video back in the day they would show up and do it in person but right a video audition correct and so they kylie would get on there and say my name's kylie k and this is that you know they might give some stats sometimes like your height or whatever right, you know right. so you know and then you read the audition you just do the part you mm -hmm. act it out so that's what she did we gave her a very a specific scene the scene about the painting mm -hmm what the painting was, how she inherited it from her mother, how she got in touch with Gregory Davidson and how the story begins. And it was a perfect scene it was. to have her audition for. And she auditioned and she nailed it. Nailed it. In fact, the scene in the movie, when you do see it, is very, very close to her original audition. Yeah, I would say yeah. so. Just a very different camera angle. Absolutely. Yep. So we meet with her at a local coffee shop, sit down with her, get to know her, find her story and all of that. I think we knew pretty quickly yep. that we had found our Lydia Drake. Right. And there's, there's many things that, again, we can't give away from the story, though, that work in favor yeah. of that as well. So we have Ava and Lydia cast. Now we need the sons. Mm -hmm. And this is tough. Yeah. And you found Drew, Drew who right. plays the older son, but originally auditioned for the younger son. So the older son's name is Matthew. The younger son's name is Samuel. Mm -hmm. And you just found him randomly on a casting site. Right. I did a search for the region because we had put it out publicly and had... We were getting a lot 200 of- 200 submissions, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, we had a lot of auditions. Um, and it just wasn't quite the right fit. Nobody the, pe was, the people yeah. who fit the parameters of looking like they could be one of your children, it wasn't the right fit. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't match the whatever. Or, didn't matter. Or sometimes, I'll just be honest, sometimes the performance wasn't yeah, there. Exactly. It just wasn't there. And I'm that's, trying to be that's nice. Important. Yeah, you're being nice. I'm being honest. Look, as an actor, you have to know that. Yeah, that's people true. People will say, you know, you've got you've to gotta be able to bring it. Yeah. You've got to be able to see this and watch it. There were good auditions. I'm not mm -hmm. saying they were, but, but if they just wasn't like, ah, I don't know, it's just not there. It's just not there. Yeah. So you had found so Drew. I, I found Drew and three other guys in the region that fit all the parameters and looked like they had at least a somewhat of a resume. And I sent them all messages and Drew was the only one that responded to that. <laughs> no, I know it, it's, it's funny, but it's almost like, no, this was being whittled down. Um, and there, and when, <laughs> when you know the story later, then it's like, yeah, it makes, now I understand why. And so Drew was a stage actor. He had never done a film. Right. Uh, but he submitted an audition and was great. He was fantastic. He, but it made us go, you know what? I'd like to see him read. Right. As the older, the older son. son. Yeah. He had a certain air about him that matched the personality of that character. Yeah. And he bears 
uh, striking resemblance to me. <laughs> striking. <laughs> That's the funny thing. And, and also to my nephew. And there's a reason for that. Yep. Because I happen to have a sister and a brother who both have kids and their kids look, we all kind of look alike, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. And especially my nephew, Dalton, mm-hmm. my sister's son, I, I was his babysitter right. for when, when I was in my twenties, I used to babysit him a lot. And I, that was back when I, you know, had my first video camera. So I shot a bunch of video <laughs> of Dalton right? and the two of us hanging out mm-hmm. and doing stuff. So I had all this footage of young Gregory Davidson with young uh, Matthew Davidson, right, exactly. essentially, yep. that we could use. So we needed the kid to actually look similar, sim- similar to Dalton. <laughs> but their resemblance is striking. Like, there, yeah, yeah. There, there are there, uh, in the film we've used uh, one of the devices we've used to transition between scenes is to have these photo montages where we put literal physical pictures on a on a table, the table we're sitting at right yeah, now. That's right. And then we would film those pictures mm-hmm. and use them as a montage to transition and you in in those when it's uh, dealing with the sons there are pictures of drew there are pictures of mason who plays samuel mm-hmm. there are pictures of dalton yeah. and you can't tell which one's which <laughs> no you can't so i mean so i'm sure could. that i'm yeah. sure that yeah you know drew and, and his parents can right. say, oh there's there's a picture yeah. of drew but it's right next to a picture of dalton where it's like yeah that's the same person yeah but it's not it's not yeah so that worked out really well yep. we knew He's going to work as Matthew. Yeah, perfect. Uh, did we even have him read as Matthew? No, I don't think we, we, we did. met him and in, we, we interviewed him as Matthew and told him in advance, hey, we're looking at you for this one instead. So he was prepared for that. But yeah, it yeah. was. I don't think we needed him to read. Now we really need the other son because <laughs> yeah. we start shooting. Yeah. We've got Ava. We've got Lydia. Yep. We've got Matthew. Yep. Let's start shooting some scenes. Well, we had already started shooting with just, this is the fun part about yeah, the way sorry, we shot. No, no, you're up. good. Yeah. Um, is, is before we cast anyone, we, f- we went through the script and pulled out everything, every single scene that was either your character or my character with nobody else in it yeah. and shot all those with just the two of us Yeah. Uh, before we had cast anyone. Just so to, now we had yeah. like 45, 50% of the yeah, movie done. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that, and so now it's at, at that point that we come back and go, okay, let's fill in the blanks. Yeah. Um, Cause we had already shot, this is the uh, kind of a neat thing and, and it's, it's easy, it's easy for you and I to pick up on because we know which scenes were shot when, right. but there are certain scenes where uh, the eye, eye line might be a little different than it is later <laughs> after we've cast where, you know, we're not necessarily looking at the same height as Kylie. Yeah. So here's the other thing. This movie is shot as a documentary. So there's always a camera on whoever it is, mm-hmm. right? You have to understand that because of that, the actors are always looking to camera mm-hmm. or talking to the person behind the camera which is Lydia Drake, who is this tiny little gal. But most of the time, the person behind the camera was you. Me. And not you a are not a tiny little gal. <laughs> yeah, what are you, six three, six four? Oh, come on. No, barely six feet. Really? Yeah. I thought you were taller than that. You've, you're, you're, I, I, well, I'm five four, I'm so six you're a mountain. like to one sixteenth of an okay. inch. Yeah, I was going to really you're getting, taller. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyways, you're a, you're a tall guy. The camera eye angle, what y'all have to understand is that when, the natural instinct for an actor is to look at the person behind the right, camera right. because that's what it's supposed to be. But you're a good eight inches at uh, least. A, a, a whole head taller. Taller than, than, yeah, than Kylie. Kylie, right? Because Kylie's my height. I she think. is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, well, okay. Although I will say this, we did a really good job of lowering the, yeah, the, camera. the camera down. And so like, if, you're, if, if you have any interest in behind the scenes stuff, when I'm holding the camera and filming James or whomever, I would lower the camera so that I'm not looking directly into the, right. the viewfinder or into the, the monitor. It's down below about my chest level. And yeah. I think we caught it for the most part. We would tell everybody, look at Matt's shoulder. shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's your eye line. Yeah. which, you know, frankly, as an actor, it's easier anyways. Cause then when you have to like engage and like I'm making this, faces. Uh, at yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> it's easier to just kind of look, okay, I'm looking at your shoulder and I'm just going to talk to your shoulder. My eyes are saying, is that really how you want to yeah, do this scene? Exactly. <laughs> So, okay. So we've shot a bunch of scenes. Now, mm-hmm. how did we do that? It's a documentary. So we used various techniques, mm-hmm. one being a teleprompter. Right. And we have this wonderful teleprompter program called Prompt Smart. It essentially moves with you as you speak. It right. learns your voice and it reads the script. As you're reading the script, it will move. So you don't need somebody, usually with a teleprompter, you need somebody there kind of moving it Wrong. along for yeah. you. This program doesn't require that. It's pretty brilliant. Wow. 
most of the time, it doesn't require that. If you're speaking softly, it might struggle with the microphone on your device. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we used this because generally speaking, we could put the teleprompter where Lydia Drake's eyeline would be. Right. And then the person would just look, look at, at the, the prompter. Te- yeah, exactly. And they could just read. And as a voice actor, for me, it was very easy because I'm used to just reading and, and not being off book, as they say, memorized. So for me, it worked great. So we shot a bunch of scenes mm-hmm. and then we shot your interviews because your character is Adam Dole. Adam is Gregory's best friend, but he's also his attorney. Right. So that, that makes it very nice because Gregory is this very successful painter who painted these paintings that made him millions and millions of dollars at one point in his life. Then he retired from it all yep. and went into not hiding, but seclusion, you know, seclusion yeah. right? <laughs> to raise his kids. Right. So Adam Dole, his attorney slash best friend, helps him manage that. And his sons now help him run, run his company, business. Right. So that brings us now to, we're shooting this movie. We've shot most of Kylie's scenes mm-hmm. where she has these, what they call, we called like diary scenes, right. kind of in the way that you would watch like a, a reality TV show right. where after there's a scene, we might cut to that person talking about what happened. So she has her little con- like confessional moments, yeah. like their, her diaries. So we shoot pretty much Almost all, all of, of those. Yeah. yeah. And we still don't have Samuel no, cast, the younger, the son, younger right. son, who is the prodigal son. Right. So what do we do? I mean, we keep trying Oh yeah, a lot. We saw a lot. And we're of getting, for that. and then we're getting just people not coming back to us. <laughs> there were people that just, yeah, they just didn't. We're like, well, what is this? We're praying about this. God, bring us the right actor. Yeah. yeah. So finally, one day, Kylie, we're, we're in. We were filming a scene with Kylie, and I think it was pro- probably pretty close to being done with all of her stuff, except for the stuff that she hadn't seen yet because we were we were withholding the secrets. Right, and we had shot stuff with her and Drew. Right. Correct. Because there were some scenes yeah. there that were very specific with them. Yeah. But she says, you know, a friend of mine who's in my acting class just got back in town. He's been out of town for a while. So he might work. Maybe he kind of has the right look. Yeah. Here, I'll give you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him and see if he's interested. So we get Mason McCarty. Mm-hmm. We see some of his work. He had done some short films. Yeah. And Mason is a very good looking young man. Hip. Very cool, great hair. Beautiful hair. Uh, people always say he looks like, he said this to me actually before, people have said to him he looks like Titus from Final Fantasy. Yes, totally and he does. does. He does. So my character from Final Fantasy X. So then we send him the sides mm-hmm. and to say he killed it, he nailed it, would be an understatement. Yeah, yeah. It was a very, it was a scene about him talking about his mother. Yeah. And man, it was just fantastic. I'll throw this out there to anybody who's in the acting world for auditions. He took it upon himself to give us multiple takes with a different uh, tone, right? A different point of view. Because, you know, when when you're going through your own script, especially Mm -hmm. as the writer, but also as as from a a production standpoint, you're going to hear it in a certain way when you're reading it. And so when Mason came in and he did it kind of the way I think we expected, it was like, wow, that's great. And he goes, I'm going to, you know, he, he, he gave a second take and it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, I love that choice. Yeah, because I think it's very important when you're going through this process as a, as a filmmaker to allow your actors to find their voice in the character as well, because it becomes yeah. more authentic. That's and, yeah. and he delivered that during his audition. He sure did. Yeah. And he had been on Stranger Things, mm-hmm. the last season of Stranger Things, I right. think. Yeah, and so he had some some credits mm-hmm. there as well. So we we met with him, yep. same coffee shop. <laughs> More like, we're going to offer him the part. Mm-hmm. Here's the only obstacle with Mason. He is six foot two. <laughs> <laughs> he is literally almost a foot taller than me. So you have to suspend some belief, I guess. But we tried to kind of cut around that. Mm-hmm. I don't think for the most part, I don't think people go, wow, it's just, you know, I think you just buy it. Yeah. there's only I think there's only maybe one spot where that's... Yeah. There's an obvious height difference. Yeah, because I wasn't, because most of the time I was on books, I was standing on Apple, Apple boxes, boxes yeah. and stuff to be taller. And Drew is taller than me as well. Yeah. Drew's probably what, 5'8", 5'9", five five eight, eight, five nine, nine, yeah. yeah. And so, but it's it's kind of negligible right. on camera. Uh, that was the only thing about it, but he was a perfect match. Yeah, man. And he is such a strong actor. He was so great. There's some very critical scenes Mm -hmm. every single one of these amazing young actors has critical scenes yeah whether it's m giving the kind of the opening yeah she sets the stage position of Mm -hmm. of who and what and all of that 
which she nailed. And then Lydia has multiple dramatic scenes yeah, big time. And, and big scenes. But then both the boys have big scenes. You have a great scene. I have a great scene. We have these big moments. I think each one of us has a, a moment in it. So that was really important. But so we now we have him cast mm -hmm. and now we can just really start shooting everything. And so we did. And we and we filled in other roles with other very talented folks. Um, uh, your sister Audrey. Oh yes, character so of Audrey Kelly D Ambrosio. Yeah. So now the funny thing about Kelly is she was originally going to be the newscaster. Yep. There's a news report in this. She was going to be the newscaster, and we shot it. Fit on on camera newscaster. Yeah. We shot it here in in, in actually in right where room. we're sitting. Yep. The green screen, we mm -hmm. set up a green screen, we shot it, it was done. She was perfect. perfect. She was great because she actually had been a news reporter. Yep, she was an years. anchor on, on news. Yep. So she has that way of just, it happened right here yeah. where I'm standing and right. you know, and all that. She has just the tones and she did it all just perfect. But we were trying to cast the character of my sister, mm -hmm. Audrey, and we were having trouble with that. Mm -hmm. It just just wasn't right we had actually even shot some scenes yeah. with someone else and it just it just wasn't working very talented actress on, on the other end but it just it just didn't work right for that particular thing for this particular character it was it, she needed to have a certain tone about her a certain air about her and kelly was just a better fit yeah and we look enough alike yeah we both have blue eyes right. we're both you know about the same you know size and size stuff wise, too right. and all and so we then came back to kelly and said kelly would you actually like to play Gregory's sister in this and it's a bigger role and all of that. And she has some wonderful moments. Really? Yeah. And then we needed to cast the artist, the art critics. Yep. So the opening of this movie has to tell out the story of Gregory Davidson. Man, there's a lot in this. You have to tell the story of who Gregory Davidson is. And if you do it like a regular docu-series, you really have to have a lot of, a lot of footage to cut to mm -hmm. and a lot of great interviews. So I'd written these characters and then we got Jason Marsden, yep. who wonderfully talented Jason Marsden from Hocus Pocus, from Goofy Movies. He's Max. He's an amazingly talented actor, as he is. And we bring him in. Well, we go to his house. Right. And we shoot. And it's on the prompter. And Jason, we it took us an hour to set up yep. the cameras. And chatting with he and his girlfriend, Remy, mm -hmm. are there. And their cat. <laughs> That's right. And we set up. Yeah. Jason runs through all of his lines in 13 minutes yep. it's 13 minutes of film we don't end up using all 13 minutes i wish we could have because every minute is gold it was his gold baby i was about to say the same thing yeah he runs through it all perfectly and it's like well there's nothing else to really do do you Thanks. have any notes yeah no, no. <laughs> it's perfect he created this character yep. mm -hmm. out of just you know stuff that i had written down of that terry blake's kind of a you know, kind of an eccentric art mm -hmm. collector and dealer. And, and so Jason puts on this orange suit, bright orange, I mean, bright orange yeah. suit. And there's it, we, we shot it around Halloween. So he had pumpkins all mm -hmm. over the place. So the whole room has got orange. this orange yeah. kind of weird vibe and you buy it because yeah. he's a weird art critic a, guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he puts on this kind of Madonna pseudo British accent, <laughs> which he thought he came up with. Yeah, this would be kind of fun. And he's just perfect. Yeah. We shoot all that. Now we've got him. We've got M. We've got Ava and Terry. Mm -hmm. That's his character's names. So now we got to get these other characters. Well, we, we originally just had one more, and that was that was Jackson. Jack. Jackson, Jackson Tennant, Tennant right. who is the art dealer that gave Gregory his big break. Right. And we filmed that with another actor. We filmed it with three actors. We filmed it with yes. three different actors. Originally, I shot the... It's funny because there's four takes of it all because i shot just like the temp track mm -hmm. because we were editing and we that's needed, right we needed the sound yep. we needed the sound so i shoot a temp track and originally in my head jackson was going to be this uh, british you know kind of art you know, yes well i saw gregory step and instantly i knew he was going to be wonderful you know he's going to be that guy yeah yeah so we were looking for that and originally i think originally in my head i had like jim cummings or somebody to play mm -hmm. it we cast one fella and he was great. He's a friend of mine. In fact, I could say Jack Daniel. He's a voice actor. He's got a wonderful voice. Tremendous. He's got a great look. Yep. He did great. We flew him out here. He shot the scene. It was great. The problem was we had some camera issues. Yep. On, uh, and the, the weird thing, this is, you know, who, who knows what this is. When we set it up, it, w it looked perfect on the monitors. Perfect on the monitors. And then as we got the footage and went to start using it, right. we realized the lighting was and the placement yeah. 
was causing stuff to be a bit noisy yeah, yeah. and almost out of focus. Right. And it was too crucial of an interview right. to have that because you're going to be cutting back and forth between these other interviews that look crisp, solid. Jason's footage is magical. It yeah. looks fantastic. Our close up of Jason with that, that 85 lens, yeah. it just is beautiful stuff. And it was crystal clear. Yep. 4K. So Jack's stuff was not. Right. Same cameras, same lenses. Yep. Different day, different lighting, different angles, farther out. Didn't work. Didn't work. And so typically in a film, what you would do is you would have that same actor come out and do reshoots. But that wasn't an option for this one. He lived 3,000 miles away and yeah. it was just, yeah, we couldn't bring him back to just shoot it because he was here visiting and all. So we started to scramble. Yeah. We've got to find him. So we went with another person who is, who's not an actor, not to, an actor. to his, to his uh, credit. He's a writer, very mm -hmm. talented writer. And we shot the whole thing with him. Mm -hmm. Good angle, good sound, all of that. But it just wasn't hitting. Mm -hmm. And he knew it too. And he said, look, that doesn't work. Don't worry about it. Just don't use it. So we didn't. And then I go to my neighbor down the street, yeah, Andrew Carney. Now, Andrew is a trumpet player. Yep. Very he, talented uh, trumpet player. Well, not just trumpets, trumpet player. Horns, horns in general. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's a musician. He's a teacher. He's a musician. He's played with Brian Setzer's orchestra for years. He's played with the LA, I don't know if it's the Philharmonic or what, but yeah, the LA Orchestra mm -hmm. or something uh, for years. He's an amazingly talented musician. And so he gets the rhythm of acting. Mm -hmm. And we and and Andrew's got kind of a quirky look to him. I'd buy him as this kind of art guy. And but he's got this kind of voice. It's yeah. just, you know, he's just very kind of low key, you know. And, and he's been blowing horns for decades. Yeah. So he's kind of got a little bit of that. And he's got a great know. look to yep. him. And because of it, he's got this permanent ring on his lip from playing the trumpet yep. too. And so he's got this great character. He's a great character actor. Yeah. He's bald, you know, he, he shaves his head and stuff. And and so he comes in and we it was the same kind of thing. Yep. We ran through it all. He's reading the prompter. He does it. Boom. We went, that's going to work. Especially with how big Jason is. Yeah. So then I go, I think we need one more. Yep. So I wrote another character in. Yeah. <laughs> Momo. Momo. We need yeah. a female yep. art critic because we have Ava, but then we, so we need two females and two males talking about Gregory Davidson's yep. art. Right. So we can cut around to those fast, quick, boom, boom, boom. This is who Gregory Davidson is. And I needed somebody to measure up to Jason. Jason. Yep. So again, my next door neighbor, Laura, comes in and nails this. She was she's done acting before and all of that, and she worked in showbiz for years. And so she comes over and just nails. She has this created thing. this character, yeah, uh, in her in this voice for this character and this, this personality. This New Yorker, yeah. Kinda, let me tell you about Gregory Davidson. Yeah, yeah, Gregory yeah. Davidson is amazing, and she just nails it. So now. <laughs> We've got all these pieces. Right. So now it's just, because it's a documentary, you can shoot it out of order. You just throw all the pieces together. And that's yep. what we started to do. You had mentioned earlier that we did this all out of pocket. And, and yeah. I, I think, you know, with what essentially the the encouragement to young filmmakers who think it requires a, an investor and, a you know, your investor can literally be your friends. Yeah. And, and you that's know, true. it can be your part-time job. Right. Um, because one of the influences as far as the, not necessarily the, the storyline that he put together, although it's a really cool movie, um, if you're into that kind of stuff, but Robert Rodriguez's film. Yeah. Where he I'm made, a um, big fan of his, made the entire film for $7,000. $7,000. And El it's, Mariachi. Yeah, yeah. El Mariachi. And it's one of, from that perspective, it's one of the most brilliant movies that you could watch for that reason. Right. What is he able to do with seven grand? A yeah. camera and some of his friends essentially and and so that became kind of a a motivator for us yeah and so i guess the encouragement would be just pick up the camera we you know i'm, I'm grabbing my cell phone you know the, the cell phones right now have more technology than they had when they put a man on the moon yeah and they have cameras that are so cinematic higher resolution than the ones that robert rodriguez yes. used to shoot el mariachi Absolutely. i'll tell you that yeah. so pick up your your phone Yep. And just start shooting scenes. But know how to do it. Know, know how, how to, to light it, it yep. and have good sound. Sound, acting, and lighting. Yep. If you have those three things and you can frame a photograph, yep. frame your shots like you're taking a picture yep. called composition. I know you know for you. Watch you know. things that you like. Yeah, exactly. And and start making notes of how, oh, they do a close up for that. Oh, now they're back over here. Yep. Oh, they're over this person's shoulder while yep. that person's talking. Okay. Yep. Just find the angles, figure it out. And that's what we had to do. And the nice thing about shooting it as a documentary is we didn't have to worry about some of the more traditional film right. storytelling things. Right. 
So we shoot all this footage. We start to assemble it. We start to really see that we've got, we've got something here mm-hmm. and we have a two hour movie. Right. Well, two hours is a documentary. That's long, long. So that, that had been the biggest thing. How do we cut it down? And that's what everybody kept saying. Oh, it's, it's just, it's long. And then we go, well, did you, would you cut anything? No, I wouldn't really cut anything, but yeah, it's long. Just, it feels long. <laughs> well, yeah. So we've cut it down to an hour 45 now. Right. And I think it's. And that includes the credits. That includes the yeah. credits. Yeah. Beginning to end. And there are, if, when you see Hidden Blessings, watch all the way through. Yes. To the very, very end. Right. Do that. Do not, not, o- not only to see all the people involved in the right. film. Right. But also because there may or may not be something revealed. Yeah. Which I think most people are used to yeah. now. You know, Marvel movies have done that. But uh, so the music. Yeah, music. Wow. This is episode 14. This is. <laughs> <laughs> this may just be a separate podcast. <laughs> the process of music for Hidden Blessings. Wow. It's an education. Yeah. So we, when I wrote this movie, I was locked up in a hotel room. And I needed inspiration and I was listening to Jars of Clay. I'm a big Jars of Clay fan. They're a Christian uh, band that was big in the 90s Mm -hmm. and the early 2000s. And I wrote a lot of the scenes with that in mind. Originally, what started this was a a song that was never even put in the movie. It's a song called Fly. Mm -hmm. Do you know that song? Yeah, I do, yeah. I'll fly with you through the night so you know I won't let you go. James is a singer too. Yeah, look at that. I don't want to sing too much. We'll have to pay him. But <laughs> I remember I have a, a DVD of them live in concert. Mm-hmm. And Dan Hazeltine, who is now a good friend of ours, right. Dan is the lead singer of Jars of Clay, is on stage telling the story of this song, which was about, oh, God, a man losing his wife mm-hmm. and in the hospital they're having this kind of, I'm, 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 I'm starting to cry here. <laughs> she's, you know, basically consoling him. Yeah. She's consoling him. I'll be okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. This is going to be, yeah. going to be okay. And in the song, the song is very powerful about that, about, you know, search your heart and your soul and your wings and take flight and fly. And yeah. now you're alive. And then, and then in the course, and then now you're alive. Now you're alive. Yeah. Now that she's gone, she's alive. Right. And so that was always such a powerful song to me. And I, that's what came up with years ago when it came out, you know, this is 20 plus years ago that Gregory's wife has to have passed away in a tragic way. Yeah. And he was there. Right. And she consoled him. Right. So that song's not even in the movie. I wanted it to be in the movie. I wanted to do like an acoustic version of it. Mm-hmm. And it just didn't work. So we write this whole thing with the thought of Jars of Clay's music being in it the whole time. <laughs> We finish shooting the movie yeah. and we put all of the songs in I think eight we, songs, eight or, nine, to, yeah. eight or nine songs total yeah. of jars of clay's music. And I'll tell you what, it's working beautifully. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's a beautiful movie yeah. with this music in it. So then another act of God, I'm talking to a friend of mine and he is going, well, I know the guys from jars of clay. <laughs> What? You know, why not? Yeah, okay. So he sets a, a meeting up with us, mm-hmm. Matt and I, and Dan Hazeltine. Yeah. So we can- and Dan is the lead singer. Dan of is Jars the lead of Clay, singer of right? Jars of Clay. We get there and thankfully, Dan is a Star Wars fan. <laughs> so I'm there going like, I am such a fan of this guy. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's so amazing to meet him. And he's going- I'm such a fan of yours. It's so great to meet you. <laughs> yeah, so it was neat. very nice. And his son, so he and his son yeah. watched Clone Wars and, and his son was a huge Clone Wars fan. And so that was very, very cool that we got to kind of bond over that yeah. and talk about it. And then he had watched the movie yeah, and he really liked the movie. He did. And he really liked the way we used the music. Yeah. So he gave his blessing to us using their music in it, but it's not that easy. No, it's not. Because unfortunately, Dan and all the band Jars of Clay don't necessarily own all of their music. No, the label owns the rights. Right. Yeah. And then there's various labels yep. because some of these things were off of different ones and they had done different recordings and been at different labels and stuff. And then they did some albums that were compilation albums with other singers. Yeah, exactly. So you're dealing with the rights of all these other people. So we've got, again, eight or nine songs we go through the publishing thing of it to get the rights for the publishing and they go, yeah, it'll be this. And it's close to 
you know, well, it's $1,500 to $2,000 a song. Per song for a limited period of time for use in this particular project, right? Yes. Then you have to renew it. And then you'll have to renew it every yeah. year, or every, you know, five years or something, right? Yeah. And so we're talking about more money than it costs to make the movie. <laughs> Just for the publishing rights. Just for the publishing rights. Yeah. Now, if we want to use the actual versions that were already made, we'd have to then get those rights and pay for those. Separately. Separately. Right. Which would be at least the same or more than what we were for the other. So again, now you're talking about probably licensing, licensing. Thank you. Uh, three times the cost of the movie. Yeah. The, the finished film with no music in yep. it just to put these songs in it. Right. Even if we then pare it down to say four songs, which we talked about for a very long time, right. which kind of loses some of the impact. Right. Now we need to find a composer because we need to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. So it's all becoming very convoluted. So for the first probably, what, six months or more, well, more of having a finished movie right. that we're shopping around, we're showing people, people like it. Mm -hmm. We don't have the rights to this music. Right. We have some music in there at the beginning that's some composition that we got from places like Envato Music, right. uh, Envato Elements. We drop it in. It works great. We love it. It's a needle drop, as they call it. So we're like, oh, what do we do? Eventually, we find out that we can afford those takes. Right. Because it's a one-time buyout fee for those songs, and it's affordable. Yeah. You know, it's a few hundred dollars for those songs. Okay, we can do that. We can we can manage that. And just to clarify something really quick, yeah. when you're showing this around, we talked about showing it to people. When you have music that you have not licensed yet, you mm -hmm. cannot charge anyone a fee to see your film. However, you can have test groups, test audiences yes. review it with that music. And, right. you know, because you're going to want to know if the music that you have in there, as one of the elements you want reviewed, does the music really, really help the story? Yeah. Or is it just a nice thing to have? Yeah. And I think for the most part, people really loved the music. They did. They did. There's this one scene in particular with Samuel where the music was just so powerful. But what do you do? So what we did was we went back to square one. And I had one of my dearest friends in the world, Tom Kell. I've talked about Tom on the podcast. I dedicated an episode to him. I played some of his music. Tom was an amazing singer-songwriter. I recorded a lot of his music that he owned and I owned the masters of because right. I recorded them at my studio. And we had been holding this music because I wanted to use it for another movie idea that we have. Mm -hmm. But I finally went, well, should we see? And I remember, was, I mean, this wasn't that long ago. We're sitting there on a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. I'm in, in my studio yep. here. You're at home in your studio. So I go, let me just drop this song. Let's in just see what happens. And see what happens. Yeah. And we're both by the end of it in Crying. tears. It was just so beautiful. Yeah. So it really was a God thing where God was like, I'm going to wait. Because yeah. he, every door we opened got closed mm -hmm. with the other music. So now this movie is featuring the music of Tom Kell, right. which makes it all the more special because Tom was, you know, such a dear friend, such an important person in my life. And his music is so important in my life. And so it helps tell the story of Gregory Davidson. And frankly, I think it fits the character of Gregory Davidson. It does. Better than the Jars of Clay music. And as an Easter egg, Tom's in the movie. He is. There's briefly. a picture of him. Very briefly, there is a, a photo of him in there too. That's right. He was actually going to play Gregory's father. We were going to have photos of him right. as Gregory's father, but we ended up cutting that out just because for time, time we yeah. cut out some scenes that were that. So now the music is complete. Done. The movie is done. Yep. Once we finalized Tom's music in there, I think it was October 5th or 10th, somewhere in that neighborhood yeah. uh, of this, of 2023 is when we actually completed the film. Yeah. So now it's ready for distribution, ready for charging tickets, all that kind of stuff. So we've taken it to a couple of different places and we did the angel platform. We did the guild thing. And I gotta be honest, uh, I was kind of disappointed with the way that worked out. Yeah. I don't mean to speak ill of the the process at Angel. I think it's all good people. I'm working on a program called Gabriel and Guardians, and that's mm -hmm. been fine. But with this particular one, I don't feel like we got a fair shake. Yeah, uh, I think the process just needs to be refined some more. I think they, they've got a neat thing going on, but it it's it's not as clear for people who are members of the guild, I think, um, necessarily to understand what it is they're about to see yeah and what they're voting on what they're and, voting and on right what that vote means right so we submitted the full film finished film to angel studios for the guild to review they said we need we can't put the whole movie out we can give 10 minutes 
Yeah. So give us 10 minutes. And I wish they had said, give us three minutes. Yeah. I, I wish they would have just taken the trailer because the trailer <laughs> sums the movie up. Right. But they don't want trailers. They want just a scene. So they said, just take, extract 10 minutes from the film, which we did. So the Gilded Angel is just people like you and I. Yeah. You, because you pay for it. You pay to be or, a guild. Member. Originally, uh, it didn't you, used to be. Right, yeah. it was it was a jury, not a guild, and you would become a member if you had invested in one of their projects. Right, it, it so you had more in it. Right, right. Now it's just anybody can join the guild for sure. a fee. It's just like any of these other, you know, streaming services. In right. my opinion, which is great, it gives their their actual audience a chance to vote on things. Yep. When it works, that's great. The issue I have with it is you then do not have filmmakers judging it as much as you have just people looking at a clip like they would be looking at a clip on YouTube. Yeah. And if it's just not hitting them the right way and they don't understand what they're seeing because the setup isn't there, right. that here is a clip, here's a portion of a movie and here's the background of that and here's what you're going to see. That's not really how it worked. It was more so like, here's 10 minutes, watch it. You're dropped in the middle of this story. You're giving away all these key elements and then you're left hanging and people were like, I don't get it. Now it was about half and half out of the the votes we got. It was, it was split. Half of the people were very excited and thank you to all of you that did vote. If you were listeners, because I know that some of you are, you were like, oh, this is great. I want to see the whole movie and stuff. And then the other half were people that just kind of didn't understand, well, is it's a documentary or what is it? And you know, they didn't have the setup. Yeah. So I wished we had been able to do that. So it didn't make it through Angel. So it will not be on Angel at Which this is point. Fine. That's fine. But we're hoping to have it somewhere. We have it being pitched to a couple of places yep. right now mm-hmm. and we'll see what happens. But the movie is finished. It is ready to go. And I would love to show it to you all. But yeah. alas. <laughs> We must wait. So now we talked about at the NRB before we go to this thing and they're like, do you have any finished things? If you mm-hmm. had something finished, we'd look at your other script. So now here it is a year later, we were like, okay, now we have a finished thing mm-hmm. and we have a script that's all so ready to be made and all of this. And then they're all like, oh yeah, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> nobody's. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, if you're a fan of football, it's like punting. Everybody's punting down the road. You yeah. Know? And uh, it, it, it's either timing wise or, or whatever the, it, the reason is, that's fine. I think that yeah. the, film industry is shaking up right now it's changing and people don't really know what to do so when you get a movie like hidden blessings that is very different Mm -hmm. and tells a story in a very different way but everybody says it's shot beautifully it sounds great Mm -hmm. it's acted tremendously all of those things we got our dove Dove. dove.org dove.org they review movies and the first thing that the reviewer says is hidden blessings is a remarkable movie on many fronts and then goes on to talk about it but because of that it's like seinfeld at the time people didn't know i'm not comparing my movie to seinfeld but i'm just saying ours is way better (laughs) (laughs) it's a movie about nothing but the the mainstream makers go we don't know what to do with this right but the audience like let the audience decide yeah so that's why we've talked about maybe having it at churches and stuff too so if you're interested in seeing hidden blessings and you'd like it to be shown at your church Make a mention on one of the comments sure. on my, on this, on this episode of the podcast on YouTube, there's places for comments on my Instagram. You can make messages right in the comments and say, Hey, I'd be interested. You know, it has to be, it has to meet the parameters to where we can actually bring it because it would cost us to bring yeah, the movie right. to a church, but we would love to bring the movie to churches. And if you that. have a relationship with your, the leadership at your church, yeah. Maybe talk to them about it first. Show them, have them listen to this or watch any of James's. Watch the trailer. Yeah, exactly. And they're interested, then you know we can we can work that out. But yeah, it, it, as much buy-in as, as as possible prior to us bringing it there is good. <laughs> yes, that's very true. Yeah. So maybe we can start a grassroots kind of thing sure. where churches start seeing hidden blessings. They start seeing the the value of it, and people start seeing it. And I I think it will make an impact. If you're not somebody of faith. I'd say give this movie a try. We talk about Jesus a lot in it, but yeah. we don't force it down your throat, hopefully like I do with this podcast. And hopefully we make you curious and we show you how much God actually loves you. Yeah. That's really the goal. That's it. You're loved. Yeah. So, Matt, this is so cool. We're going to have to keep doing this. We'll have to do <laughs> more fun. of these. But we've given a very, very broad strokes still. We didn't really give a lot away about the movie, right. but... At the same time, I think we've given people a good insight into what it took for us to make this movie. Yeah, so, agreed. Thank you for being my guest here on the podcast. 
you'll do it again. Right? I love it. I'd, I'd love to. And, and I, I would say this, let the audience decide. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We have more stories to tell. We will continue to do them. We'll do an episode on the comic shop and tell everybody because that boy, that movie I think needs to get made too. I agree. And uh, I won't ask what, I know you're working on some other things, but I don't know that I can, that's I public can, knowledge. Yeah, no, it, it's, well, we're in limbo. Yeah, so. So it's, uh, but uh, we had the opportunity, my cousin Brandon and I produced a proof of concept for a first century project, which was pretty fun to do. Yeah. Um, and so we're kind of in limbo on that. But, um, yeah. but hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have more news on that soon. Good, good, yeah. good. Well, thank you again. And there it is. I hope we get a chance very, very soon for you all to see the film Hidden Blessings. We are trying to make new ways for it to get out there. We might, you know, I might put it out. I, I own the Hidden Blessings, the movie website and stuff, and maybe I'll just create a website and make the movie available and you could rent it for like five bucks or something. I try to not do those things. I don't want to take everybody's money for these things, you know. I try to get, make the podcast and all the stuff I do out here as free as I can. But I know many people would like to see the movie. So hopefully we'll come up with a way for it to be streamed. You know, say a prayer if you're somebody that prays or, prays or whatever, that the movie gets seen soon. We've pitched it to like places like Netflix and stuff too. Wouldn't it be wonderful if it was on Netflix? That'd be easy, right? That'd be, you know, because everybody kind of has that. Well, not everybody, but you know what I mean. All right, I'm rambling on. Hopefully you get to see the movie Hidden Blessings soon. I can't wait for you all to see it. Some of you have seen it because I've sent private links. And for all of you, you're very kind. You've all liked it and it's done very well. We've done very well at film festivals. We won Best Faith-Based Film and I won Best Actor at We Regret to Inform You Film Festival a few months back in Austin, Texas. That was great. And we've been nominated and selected for several other film festivals coming up which is exciting. So hopefully we'll win some more laurels, as they say, and people will get to see the movie. In the meantime, I thank you for taking the time to listen to these pieces of interview. I hope you enjoyed my time with Matt. I've got a deeper interview with Matt telling him. He has an amazing story that we ended up extracting from this because it was just getting so long, and I wanted to do as a separate interview. I've also got interviews. So even though the show's called Talking to Myself and it's me doing all the characters, I'm actually going to be doing a lot of interviews this year on the show. I'm going to be interviewing my good friend Tom Wilson. We're going to be talking about all sorts of fun stuff. I'm going to do another interview with my buddy, Matt Buds, and I'll probably have some other guests on here soon. In the meantime, thank you for joining me. And Mr. Announcer Guy, do that legal mumbo jumbo. Talking to myself, the James Arnold Taylor podcast is a production of Yumigo Inc. Recorded at Chat Studios. Engineered, written, recorded, and produced by, you guessed it, James Arnold Taylor. All voices are parody and should be construed as entertainment only. All music and sound effects used with permissions and licenses through backtracks, digital juice, production tracks, and partners in rhyme. James Arnold Taylor's Talking to Myself, the podcast. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. Thanks so much. Again, drink your water. Breathe. You got this. Every time in life when you feel like you don't, listen to an episode of the James Arnold Taylor podcast and know that I'm sitting there. I'm rooting for you, man. I am for you, okay? Let's all know what we believe and why we believe it. Let's know more than we want to know. And let's challenge ourselves to seek the truth in all things and knock on that door because he's knocking as well. You know what I'm saying? And just accept that, okay? Search for good and you will find it. Bless you all. Love you. See you next time on the James Arnold Taylor Podcast. And goodbye. Hopefully my voice will sound better next time.